and welcome to the latest installment of PSG Talking. I'm your host, Ed, and on today's show, we're reacting to the Champions League draw. Uh, before we get started, go ahead and subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. We're also over on Substack with PSG Talk Extra Time, so subscribe there for in-depth columns from myself and other PSG Talk contributors. And of course, check out PSGTalk.com for all your Paris Saint-Germain news. All right, let's get into the Champions League draw for the quarterfinals, and the the whole bracket is now set. And joining me to help do all that is Ethan from PSG Fan Club Boise, fresh off his appearance on CBS Sports Galazzo. Ethan, how are things on your end? Yeah, thanks, man. Uh, Thanks for having me on. Always love to talk some PSG with you, and it was uh, it was an exciting morning. Um, Yeah, it was. uh, I I don't know about you, but I was uh, I was up at five a.m. to watch the draw here. in mountain time and uh yeah i was pretty pretty thrilled with how that went but yeah let's get into it the champions league draw quarterfinals went down this morning it's psg versus barcelona in the quarterfinals of the champions league we last faced them in 2021 i believe uh, in the round of 16 uh, we ended up advancing psg did 5-2 on aggregate so pretty comfortably um, and then, of course, we know what happened in 2017 in the round of 16 when PSG lost 6-5 on aggregate to Barcelona after going up 4-0 in the first leg. So with that history in mind, Ethan, what was your initial reaction to once again drawing Barcelona in the knockout stage of the Champions League? Yeah, so my initial thought was, uh, well, uh, for anyone watching the, the draw live saw this, but uh, what was happening at the end is that it was everyone had been most everyone had been drawn and it was just us uh so so i i believe man city was drawn and then it was they were going to get either real madrid us or barcelona and so i'm thinking man if if they call barcelona here or it just the way it worked out is we had a two thirds chance to get either real madrid or man city and then they drew the other one that's in that tie and I was thinking, wow, like that's a relief. I mean, that that could have been us playing one of the two big boys uh, in the quarterfinals, and you know we're trying to make a run. I'm not one to shy away from. Oh, let's play weaker teams as long as possible. But with this team, it feels a little different. I, I think I'm a little more open to uh, a weaker draw to make a run because at this point, I'll take a Champions League any way we can get it. The first thing I thought about, not, oh, what's the weather today? What am I going to eat for breakfast? It was, who did PSG draw? You know, it's kind of like Christmas morning. You know, you wake up. Okay, so I get on my phone, and then I'm like, ah, oh, my phone died. I forgot to charge it overnight. So I'm like, I don't know who we drew. So then I run over, I get on my laptop, fire it up, and then I see Barcelona. And immediately I thought, all right, a familiar foe, someone, you know, that we have a lot of history with. And then I and then I started thinking about well this isn't your Barcelona of the past this is a different makeup a, a younger team even though they do have Lewandowski but I thought this is a winnable uh, draw here we we could do this and then I zoomed out a little bit and I was like oh my goodness I'm looking at the whole and we'll talk about the whole bracket in a second but I was like we might actually be able to get to the final I don't know about winning the whole thing but you've got two of the big big boys over on the other side that are going to knock each other out. And then one of Arsenal and Bayern Munich are going to be out. So if there was ever a chance to luck your way into a final, this is it for PSG. And so, yeah, of course you want to, you want to always knock out of Real Madrid and all that, but we are already, I think ahead of schedule with this team. We have so many young players. I'll take a Champions League final any way I can get it. So that was my initial thought, like, wow, this is great. A team that we have a lot of history with, but both teams are a lot different than, you know, back in 2017 or even back in 2021. So, you know, it's going to be um, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be an interesting tie. That I think that um, I don't think it's a given, but I think someone over on our Discord, I want to give them credit. Um, I can't probably find it right now, but they said they gave the the odds basically for who you know PSG might draw, and they said if it's if it's Barcelona or Atletico, according to the odds maker, that's going to be a favorable draw, and so all those teams that would have been favorable are on our side of the bracket. So, in terms of the odds makers out there, and you're hoping for maybe an easier quote unquote easier draw, PSG got it, which almost 
never ever happens but in this last edition of the champions league it's kind of fitting that we we kind of have a you know a bone thrown our way after years and years of difficult draws we finally get one that appears at least on the surface to be winnable so that was my thought um either i mentioned you know zooming out and that's what i want to do next so we look at how the whole draw turned out Manchester City and Real Madrid are going to battle the next round. We've got Arsenal and Bayern Munich. If PSG advance, they'll play either Dortmund or Atletico Madrid. Um, it's a very lucky draw, as I mentioned. Have you Now that you see how everything has laid out, have your expectations for this season changed much at all? Yeah, that's a great question. And I was thinking that earlier. Uh, I think I briefly spoke uh, to someone about it this morning. Uh, I, I think... When we had started the season, if you told us, you know, win Liga, obviously, uh, we should win the Coupe de France, barring something weird. And then if we make the quarterfinals of the Champions League, then that's that's great. Uh, just because when you get to the quarterfinals, it's a random draw. You don't know who you're going to play or how tough of a, a side you might get. And so it's really up in the air. You can really only maybe bank on getting to the quarterfinals on pure skill and then after that, there is an element, uh, at least a little element of chance involved. So um, that said, yeah, I would have been thrilled uh, in August when you said, yeah, we're going to be in the Champions League quarterfinals. Now, n- now with this draw, things feel kind of different. It feels like I'm not going to be super bummed if we don't make the final, but it feels like we really should do it this year. Uh, like you said, don't know if we'll win because we'll be pl- probably playing I mean, one of those four on the other side, they're all very good. Uh, a PSG hater would probably list all four of the teams on the other side of the bracket as all being stronger than us. I don't think all of them are stronger than us. I think we're we're better than one or two of them. But uh, yeah, it, it really, the expectations do change now for sure. Uh, and, and like you said, we historically have the most difficult uh, Champions League round of 16 opponents historically over the last 13 years. And then the quarterfinals, of course, haven't been kind to us either. Uh, we've had, I mean, basically the only year we've had an, a relatively easy draw in this part of the competition was in 2020 and we made the final. So looking again, if you think all it takes for PSG to to make the final is, is to have a, a decent team there and and get a little bit of a favorable draw, then you would expect us to do the same here. So, uh, yeah, it's you're to, yeah totally right. Expectations are different. It, it feels, and and I also want to touch on the fact that you mentioned we're ahead of schedule as a team. I I totally agree with that. The thing is though, uh, and I just think back to my San Francisco 49ers who lost the Super Bowl a couple of weeks ago uh, in 2020, uh, the same season that PSG made the Champions League final. Um, my Niners lost the Super Bowl, and we all considered that to be, oh, no, it's okay, we're ahead of schedule. Well, it took us four years to get back, and then we didn't win it again. So you never know when you're going to get these opportunities. Sometimes winning early, quote-unquote, is, is actually winning on time. or uh, you, you know, The window may not be open as long as you expect all the time. So I, I think we really got to go for this, take advantage of it. It's a great point. It's a great point because, you know, we are saying we, we've got Zaire Emery, 17 years old. You know, we've got players coming back from injury, Nuno Mendez. We've got a lot of new faces that are coming into the team. So we think that maybe we're ahead of schedule. But at the end of the day, we've got Kylian Mbappe at least for a couple more months. And whenever you have him, I think you have to be – I don't think you're ever really truly like an underdog unless you're facing a Manchester City who just have star power at every position. So I think up against Barcelona, PSG will be favored. They should win. They do have the better team. I think if you look at both uh, squads, I don't know how many, and maybe if you want to chime in on this, how many of these Barcelona players are getting into the starting 11 at PSG? Do you have, do you reckon uh, have a guess at, at that? Yeah, so um, that's another good point. Uh, maybe Bar- Kunde, uh, you know, we're we're lacking on defense so i think he would easily get in there yeah i think he could um frankie de jong yeah yeah goalkeeper uh, potentially um uh let me think uh well i mean if you're talking a true nine Lewandowski, uh even though he struggled in the champions league this season 
Mm -hmm. You got to say just the experience. He's got a better shot than someone like Gonzalo Ramos or Cole Mwani. But then again, when we actually play the tie, uh, Mbappe will probably be listed as the striker, but not really play as a true nine. So uh, that right. that's a bit of a weird one. But I will say Barcelona, uh, Barcelona a lot of injuries right now. Uh, Gavi mm-hmm. out for season, Balde out for season, De Jong and Pedri both might miss yep. the first leg and maybe p- potentially the second leg. If they're missing all four of those guys, then it would be pretty sad if we didn't go through. Uh, Barcelona was my dark horse to win the Champions League at the beginning of the season. And mm. uh, with this draw, if they were totally healthy, I'd say, hey, look at that. My prediction looks like it's going to be pretty good. You know, they have a very good shot at the final. Uh, uh, of course, we'd be tough, but whoever wins in this quarterfinals got to be favored uh, against Atletico or Dortmund. Um, but yeah, with all their injuries, I think that's the killer for them. Um, I, I don't think they'll... We'll get into predictions, of course, in a bit, but uh, I, I don't think we will lose this tie just because of their injuries, especially um, they have seven players that are facing suspension for the second leg. If they get a yellow yes. card in the first leg. So if we get a couple, if we, we get it in their heads a little bit, maybe get an early lead. They have to play a bit scrappy because they don't want to go down by too much at the park. Uh, even though of course they have shown that they can reverse huge uh, deficits in the return leg. But uh, you know, like you said, different team. This isn't their same team from 2017. Um, so if 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 we get off to an early lead, I think it's just going to make it much harder for them. If if I mean, if they have a couple guys pick up yellow cards and they're out for the second leg, uh, I mean, they're already going to be playing with two or three backups in this tie. So if we can extend that to five or six, then we should be fine. Yeah, I completely agree with you, and you know, just. I don't. I wonder how that's going to change the tactics for Luis Enrique. You know, you're at home. Do you sort of try to to bait some of those players who are one yellow card away from missing the second leg? I mean, you hate to do it. It's maybe not a, a pure way of playing the game, but it would almost be negligence to not try to get some of those players suspended uh, for the second leg and try to do whatever it is you can to get them to lose their cool a little bit. And you know, they'll be aware of it, and they'll be maybe. They won't put in a, a, a challenge or something like that. And I think PSG absolutely need to take advantage of those players uh, worried about missing the second leg and, and hopefully get a couple of them, you know, to uh, to be suspended. Um, I did, you know, I was looking and, of course, the Barcelona Twitter account, you know, remember this, of course you do, and it's Messi and Neymar back in 2017 when they pulled off that uh, fraudulent, fraudulent comeback. I mean, I... How tone deaf do you have to be? I mean, there's nothing about that match that doesn't just scream max, match fixing to you. I mean, everything about that was completely suspect in every single way. And they touted it like it was just this massive comeback that they yeah, completely they earned on their own. I mean, maybe they paid for it, but I mean, it's I, how, how can you be so tone deaf? Everybody who is even a casual fan knows that that game was fraudulent. Yeah, I, I know you dislike Barcelona a lot more than I do, uh, but but even for me, and I, I respect Barcelona a lot, which I know some PSG fans don't get that, but I respect them a lot, and even I, and I root for them. Uh, bet- between their the El Clasico rivalry, I've always much preferred Barcelona. Uh, that said, and I try and even stay rational and and even on this, uh, you know their match fixing thing. It's suspect. It, it's not a good look for them right now. And uh, that ref that was there for La Remontada basically never refed a big Champions League game again. UEFA, He's a DJ now. Yeah, UEFA, uh, uh, what's what's the term? Um, he indirectly admitted that uh, he screwed up big time and they pulled him from all big matches. I think he, he refed two Champions League group stage matches. The rest of his career, and then after that, he's just been in Germany. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's almost as bad as like Marseille, you know, claiming their Champions League title, which we won't get into. But it's like oh, it's the same thing. It's like these clubs yeah. know that they're wrong. Oh, they know yeah. that there's very serious questions to be asked about the Mar- these results, yeah, and yeah. they keep like celebrating them. And it's like, yeah, the just Mar- sit down and stop. You're the embarrassing Mar- yourself. The Marseille thing is is way way worse in my opinion, but. <sighs> um, because that was for a Champions League title, right? And they were blood doping, and it was run by the club, and there was active bribery. 
Uh, I think this was, if it wasn't at least Barcelona uh, bribing the refs, then it was just a ref that shouldn't have been there was, you know, in charge. And, uh, you know, maybe somebody else paid him off. There was some sort of match fixing. Who knows? You know? Yeah. But uh, even if there wasn't, uh, he clearly did a bad job. And of course, we didn't play well that night, but we should have qualified. I mean, that it, it comes down to the Sergio Roberto goal at the end was just because we were so rattled. But the goal right before it to make it 5 5 on aggregate, and of course, we had the away goal lead. Uh, that penalty on Suarez, where Marquinhos quote unquote fouled him. Yeah. Uh, how that's that how that call was was ever made, ever <laughs> given a penalty. That is where that referee's career. That's where he ruined his own career for me. Obviously, not a penalty. And if they had gone out and scored two goals despite that, you know what should have been a no call, then good on them. I, I, yeah. you know, you you, you got to respect it. But uh, that call left it so that they had a few minutes to get one goal. And like I said, I'm never going to say we played well that match, that t- that you know that second leg. But that penalty should have never been given. So and it's easy to understand why you would get rattled. I mean, you're on the road and you're actively having your Champions League dreams snatched away from you in the most yeah. unfair way possible. Anyway, we won't die. I mean, that, that's the history. It's important to remember what had, has gone on between these two clubs. And of course, they're going to keep bringing that up, but they forget how, you know, they, they you know, I also remember Kylian Mbappe uh, dragging PK uh, on his way to scoring a hat trick. So um, yeah. they, they conveniently forget about that. Yeah. And one other, uh, on this day in 1995, we, uh, we beat Barcelona 3-2 on aggregate, 2-1 at the park. The park mm. was the second leg, so it was today in 1995. Uh, and that was, uh, I think, Vincent Guerron scored an 83rd minute uh, goal outside the box, and that sent us to our first ever uh, Champions League semifinal. So mm. uh, they have a round of 16 win over us in March uh, that was memorable. But to be fair, we have a quarterfinal win over them that's memorable. So, yeah, theirs was a nice comeback, but ours sent us in the semifinals. They got knocked out in the quarterfinals right after they beat us that year. So, uh, yep. and convincingly by Juve, I think they lost three zero on aggregate. So, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. What was got, it all for? <laughs> what was exactly? We made the semifinals, and George Weah won the Ballon d'Or in '95 because of it. And uh, yeah, you guys made the quarterfinals, and they got smacked by Juve. So, you know, I uh, off of uh, you know a, a soft penalty call. So, congrats, I guess. Um, yeah, con- I pre- congrats I pre- on. I prefer on the- our history. I prefer semifinals over quarterfinals, personally. This is true. I also prefer not being basically bankrupt and you know embroiled in all the things that Barcelona are currently embroiled in. But we're we're talking about this storyline, and it's certainly something we want to keep in the back of our mind. But I want to ask you, what is in your mind going into this tie? What is the biggest storyline? Is it Dembele, you know, playing against his former club? Is it Mbappe playing his soon-to-be arch rival if he goes to Real Madrid? Is it Luis Enrique going up against the club he played and managed for? He, Luis Enrique was also the manager back in 2017 for Barcelona when they made that comeback. Or is it that Messi played for both of these clubs? And um, you know, you can also throw Neymar uh, in there as well, that we sort of took those two stars from them and they played for us. So what in your mind is the biggest storyline here? Yeah, biggest storyline without a doubt. It's the Ronaldinho Derby. No, I'm joking. Um, I forgot uh, about Ronaldinho. Yeah, yeah that, you're right. That was my first ever PSG kit, Ronaldinho. That's kind of Zlatan, I, right? Didn't he play for both clubs? Oh my gosh, did he? I forgot. But I think um, he did. Yeah. I anyway, look it up. I, I always love Ronaldinho. Uh, he was like the first guy I ever remember thinking, like, yeah, that was my. He was my first favorite PSG player. Way, yeah, way, he did. Back, Zlatan did play for day. Barcelona. Yeah. He didn't. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. No, he um, did. He did. Oh, he did. Oh, weird. yeah. Uh, Two thousand nine. He, he moved to Barcelona. He was all over yeah. the place. Yeah, he he moved a lot. But um, uh, yeah, yeah, Ronaldinho. Yeah, I love that guy. But um, obviously, no, the tie is not about Ronaldinho. Um, even though I kind of wish it was. Um, but now to me, it's it's Luis Enrique against uh, Xavi, and you know, former manager going up against you know, master against the apprentice. Even though the apprentice is at a uh, club with you know quote unquote higher prestige amongst most football fans. Uh, I think it's going to be really good. I, I think I'm feeling a Lucho masterclass in this tie. Uh, not that Javi's a bad man; he's he's a very good manager, and I'm 
you know, I'm not really sure why he's leaving at the end of the season for Barcelona. I feel like he's done really well there. But uh, I feel like Luis Enrique is going to be cooking up something real good. Uh, my one concern is that Hakimi is going to miss the first leg at the Parc yeah. de France. Mm-hmm. And I'm assuming we'll probably end up playing Warren Zaire Emery. Uh, and maybe we go with a Fabian Ruiz, Ugarte, uh, you know, double, double sixes sort of a thing. And then maybe Vitinha. Uh, which would take a little bit of the sting out of our attack. We'd be playing a little bit more defensively. Um, but I don't know. Maybe that's that's what we'll need. That's up to Lucha to decide. But yeah, Hakimi missing the first leg is important as well. But I it's don't got- know if I think I don't know if I see Ugarte playing in this one. He just hasn't been, you know That's a good a, point too. He might not. Yeah, he just hasn't played much in the Champions League. Yeah, which then then what's your midfield if you do that? If uh, you know I mean, for the the second leg, it's a little easier because Warren Zaire Emery will probably actually be playing midfielder. But uh, I think first... Fabian Ruiz has got to be in there. He's he been to. in really yep. good form. He has to. Uh, and then Vitinha as well. Yeah, and then it's just: Do you only have two midfielders? Uh, who, who do you play as a six? Do you play Danilo as a six, even though he hasn't most of the year? Uh, yeah, it's a bit weird with with Hakimi out. I, I would leave Zaire Emery in the midfield, and and if you can. Um, Mukiele play him at right back. Yeah, I think that's the smartest, but uh, I think Luis Enrique, I think it's very clear he's probably not going to lean that way. Yeah. Um, yeah, he, he wants a true, he, he's, he would rather have a true midfielder on the wing, you know, that, that wing, like the defensive wing there, than have a, a very strong defensive presence. So I, I can see Danilo coming in and playing that defensive midfielder role with, uh, yeah. you know, with, with screen yards back in training. He might be available and you've got, you know, Marquinhos will be available. Baraldo as well. Lucas yeah. Hernandez. So I think you've got enough options where you don't need Danilo to play center back. You can have him maybe move up a little bit and play yeah. defensive midfielder. That could be yeah. an option. Yeah. It might not be bad. It's weird though. Screen yard might end up being the fourth center back once, once he's healthy. Cause Baraldo's on amazing form, but I don't think that you uh, start anyone over center back. Uh, uh, you know, sorry, I worded that poorly. Uh, Lucas Hernandez and Marquinhos probably got to be your guys uh, right now at center back. I, I would think, assuming they're playing with two, I'm sure they will. But um, Baraldo's making a tough case, and yeah, Skriniar is going to have to win a bit of a kind of have to win his job back. Yeah, he's gonna have to win his job back, and and I saw another tweet. One of the Barcelona fan accounts was like, you know, PSG's defense is weak, and I f- I'm not saying it, it's the best ever, but I feel like really with Beraldo coming in, he sort of like calmed things down, and we're not leaking as many stupid goals as maybe we were earlier in the season or in, in seasons past. So yes, it needs to be improved, but he's part of that improvement process, and I think we're only gonna get better. And really, at Barcelona, who really scares you? Lewandowski, okay, he's he's older, maybe not, not as you know fleet not, of foot. So not even he only has two Champions League goals this season. Yeah. One of them was a couple of days ago. The other one was on match day one. He didn't score a Champions League goal for four months. So, right. I mean, I think yeah, set pieces he could be dangerous, but yeah, I, I like yeah. having Skriniar. He's a little bit taller. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, physical. I like having him in there. So maybe just matchup wise, maybe with Lewandowski, he, you know, screen yard makes sense there. So I feel good about that. But just back to my question, what I think is the biggest storyline, I think is probably, you know, Mbappe. You know, we're, we're thinking about what's going to make all the headlines. I think it is going to be Mbappe going against Barcelona. I even think we'll probably have some Real Madrid fans uh, supporting us to take out their, their rivals there in the Champions League. So. Um, I think that's going to be the big headline. We saw last time these two played, he had the hat trick. So, yeah, I think Mbappe playing his rivals, going to Spain in that big, um, you know, stage uh, against Barcelona in Spain with his impending uh, departure from PSG and going to Real Madrid. I think that's just going to be a big storyline. But, you know, it's a good one. You said Luis Enrique going up against his former club. I think that's going to be massive and it's a real test for him. He's going to see an opportunity here. He would tell the players, hey, we, we could do this. And I think training is going to be intense. And I, I like the mindset. Nasser saying the right things, the pre- club president, that there's no pressure. We're calm. Whatever happens, happens. I think everything at the club is like fitting perfectly right now. Um, and things that they club that can't even control are fitting together with the draw. So 
Everything seems to be coming together for this club, and we just need to stay calm, stay healthy, and play smart. And I, I trust Luis Enrique to uh, to get that right. Now, I got to ask you, who do you think Messi's going to be uh, pulling for in this one from his oh. home in Miami? Oh, gee, who could it be? <laughs> Man, it's a, it's a tough one. Is it going to be the club that he played for for 25 years, or is it the one that <laughs> looks like they held him at gunpoint to apologize for going to Saudi Arabia after he skipped training? Um, yeah, well, man. someone would say, you know, Mbappe is going up against, you know, Barcelona and Messi is is there, you know, the best player in the club history and Mbappe is probably the best player in club history at PSG and Messi came here, basically trained to win the World Cup and he ended up beating France and Mbappe. So it's another little underlying uh, storyline there to uh, keep in mind. So, yeah. yeah, when these two clubs get together, it's going to be bad blood. Yep. There's no way that none of their players who are on a, a yellow card suspension are not going to get suspended for the second leg. I think it's absolutely it's going to be feisty. You know, we might we might get some some uh, interesting battles there out on the pitch. It's it's going to be really intense. I'm really excited and looking forward to this one. Let me ask you, you mentioned Hakimi being suspended for the first leg here. Is that your biggest concern going into this tie or is there another concern that you have? Uh yeah, that's a good question. Um, I hmm, I think that probably would be you know I, to briefly touch on a point that you went over a few minutes ago. Uh, Bar- some Barcelona fan you mentioned said our defense hasn't been as good. Uh, I did the math yesterday in anticipation for all these draws, and Barcelona has allowed only one less goal in the Champions League than we have this year. So their defense is similar, and they were in a, a weaker group. Um, you know, they don't have another team from their group still in the competition. Uh, Dortmund is over in the, you know, quarterfinals for us still, and we had to play them. Only led one goal to them between both legs in the group stage. Um, yeah, so I don't think our defense, and of course, you think about almost half the goals we've allowed in the Champions League this season were at St. James's Park when we just came out with the worst game plan of all time against Newcastle. So, Outside of that, we've allowed... That's uh, why I don't like that two-man midfield you were suggesting. I, I had flashbacks yep. to that when we had yeah. that open midfield. Yeah, I, I agree. And and I guess, yeah, I'm going to touch on the midfield. Uh, I could do it now, I guess, is... Um, yeah, we've allowed, what, five Champions League goals in seven games outside of that, essentially. And so the defense is starting to figure it out. I feel like having Lucas Hernandez at center back... Uh, is going to do us really well now that Nuno's healthy and starting. I want to see how our midfield is going to do against their midfield. Now, Gundogan has a bit of a a reputation for being super clutch. He was really clutch at Man City. Some of their uh, late Champions League wins, you know, where they win on the final day, uh, he was uh, integral in in, in, uh, in some of those. So Gundogan can be really clutch. I think if there's someone for Barcelona that's going to rip us apart. I could see it being him and not ripping us apart, um, you know, in attack, just, just in all facets. He's just a really balanced midfielder. Uh, I want to see our midfield absolutely dominate this game. I feel like if we come out with a, um, you know, Warren Zyre Emery, Vitinha, Fabian Ruiz midfield, and if the press is really good, if it's, if everyone's dialed in, then I feel like we could do really good, you know, really damage them early on in this tie, especially at home, home crowd behind us. Park is going to be rocking. Uh, that's what I want to see the most. If the midfield kind of shows up and kind of puts up a dud, even if we just win by a goal or or maybe a draw, uh, I, I'm still thinking like, man, uh, we could have could have seen more from that midfield given that Barcelona is so injured. I mean, Gavi and Pedri both probably gonna miss the first leg. So uh, Gavi's definitely gonna miss it. He tours they see. And De Jong as well. De Jong, and De Jong, maybe. yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. So um I, I want to see domination in the midfield. You know, and, and I've always said football is one in the midfield, titles are one in the midfield. And uh so let's let's prove it. If you know, I, I think someone like Vitinha could have an absolute field day, could be a, a tie that we potentially remember him for for a long time if if they all do their jobs so that's what i'm most looking forward to but uh any concerns or any any mismatches or you know um matchups that stand out to you i think i'm most worried maybe it's a silly worry but i 
if Mbappe isn't clicking, if, if Barcelona does find a way to silence him and, and take him out of his game, do we have another goal scorer? I mean, we like Gonzalo Ramos, but if he's not getting the service, he he's sort of not as effective. Colomani really is, is not really hit the ground running this season, so he's he's not going to be scoring goals for us. Usman Dembele can do everything but score. And so I'm just wondering if you're Barcelona and you're like, all right, we, we're not going to let Mbappe beat us. You know, you, you think back to the, the 90s Chicago Bulls and you have the Jordan rules, right? You just take him out of the game as much as you can. Hit him, foul him, triple team, whatever you got to do. What if Barcelona does something like that with Mbappe? And not even saying it'll work, but if they slow him down where he's not able to be as impactful, what do we do then? Who's going to pick up the slack? I think that is my biggest concern because we've seen in past seasons Mbappe can go quiet. It's not like he lights it up every time he steps on the pitch for PSG in the Champions League. And so my, my worry is that he maybe takes a step back or Barcelona takes him out. And then we have to figure out who, who can pick up the slack, who can score the goals for us. I don't yeah. know if we have anyone that's that reliable. Yeah, that's that's a great point. And Mbappe has a, a phenomenal record against Spanish teams in the Champions League. But uh, you know that that doesn't just mean any time he plays a Spanish club, he's going to go off. Of course, I mean things can change. This is a different Barcelona team than a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. If uh, man, and especially the delivery uh, to Ramos, that that'll be big if we can't if we're not getting anything from Mbappe. Because yeah, like you said, they double triple team him. It's it's going to be tough. So uh, that's kind of why I said if we dominate the midfield, then I, I, if someone like Vitinha has a phenomenal day, then I think even if Mbappe is not doing great, I would still probably guess that we'll win just because of the sheer number of chances that the midfield will be creating for the attack. And, you know, maybe someone random like Ruiz gets on the end of a goal or maybe uh, something like an empty netter falls to or an open netter falls to Dembele off of a, you know, like a shot in the box bounces around. Who knows? Um, who who yeah. is going to be our uh, uh, Chupa Moting? This season's Chupa Moting. Oh, man. Yeah. That, that's, and we forget, you yeah, know, Bradley Barcola, he's certainly a player who could yeah. score for us. I mean, we've seen him against Real Sociedad, and he's kind of had a little dip in form, but, you know, he could do something. Marco Asensio, kind of, again, a little bit of a dip in form, but. He's he's proven he can score goals for us. So we, we have players who can do it. I just don't know who's going to do it. Who's going to step up? Because I definitely can see a world where Mbappe is quieted for maybe 45 minutes, an hour, something like that in the match, and maybe we go down a goal and we've got to dig deep. Do We have a lot of young players who are together for the first season. Who Who's going to emerge you know, and, and be that goal scorer for us? Yeah, all, all good concerns. Um... Yeah, I guess I, I don't know if I've got anything to touch on that, but uh, it's yeah. funny. Uh, we almost kind of forgot Barclow for a second. Yeah, his, <laughs> his form's been a bit down. Now that I think about it, Barclow might be key. Uh, the way mm-hmm. that he and Mbappe often take up sort of the same space on the the wide part of the you know outside of the box or or inside the wing just a little bit. I think how they they work together is going to be crucial. Um, so far, Nuno Mendes has gotten into the attack a little bit. He's had a couple good crosses, but nothing big. But um, that's that's a good point. If, if Nuno and especially Barcola can have really strong days, uh, then, I mean, if they're double-teaming Mbappe, then you're going to get a bunch of one-on-ones with Barcola, and he's quick enough. He's going to get chances. I cannot remember for the life of me who's going to play right back for Barcelona in this. Um, can't remember off the top of my head. Whatever. Uh, like I said, I, I've always said I, I don't follow other clubs too much. I, I really follow PSG. That's ninety eight percent of the football I watch. But um, I feel like they have a really good right back. Am I just spacing? I probably am. But uh, is it is it Kunde? You know, it, it might actually. Yeah, it is because I think in their last game a couple of days ago. I think they had that that young kid Kubarsi or whatever his name is. Yeah, I think he was with Christensen, was it not? It's center back. Yeah, Andreas Christensen. Yeah, yeah, he was. So yeah, Kunde was probably on the right actually. Well, Kunde is good. Yeah, so yeah, he's really good. Kunde against Barkola, that might be uh, a one v one matchup where they just kind of 
uh, like in basketball, just ISO, just one on one, see who can beat the other. And I wonder if Barkola will do something from that. I guess we'll see. It'll be a good test as he Barkola is trying to break into the French national team. I think this will be a, a good test for him uh, to prove that he deserves a spot and potentially some playing time. Um, Ethan, we're going to wrap up this episode, but I've got one more question for you. I want you to finish this sentence. PSG will advance past Barcelona if fill in the blank. If Ooh. what? Oh, good question. Um, if off the top of my head, first thing I'm thinking, uh, if Vitinha is the best midfielder on the pitch for both sides. Oh, I like that. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. I'll go with that. He, he's been PSG's secret weapon in the Champions League. No yes. one really talks much about him. Yep. But if you're a PSG fan and you watch this team, they sort of go as Vitinha goes. Yeah. Yeah. He, I mean, he won uh, man of the match in one of the group stage games. Uh, I tweeted this a couple days ago. Uh, uh, I have some of my English buddies, or English, sorry, Premier League buddies. They're not all English. Some of them are, but a lot of them are American. And they said, man, I only watch PSG in the Champions League. And Vitinha is really good. And I'm like, thank you. That's what I'm trying to tell some of our supporters all the time. Um, and then I will say, it does seem like Vitinha will step up more in Champions League games. So he, he's almost been better in the UCL this season than he has in Liga. But uh, yeah, no, totally right. But I want to know, um, and you could piggyback off of mine, but I guess if you had to think of uh, a different if, uh, what would yours be? I'm going to go on on defense. I initially wanted to say if Gianluigi Donnarumma can continue his really fantastic form, if he can make several key saves and keep us in games, maybe a clean sheet in one of these, then I think we're we're going through. We're we're going to go past uh, Barcelona. So I, I I'm going to go with him, but I'm also thinking Marquinhos. Um, hasn't always stepped up at this stage of the tournament in past seasons. If he can have a really solid game and kind of turn back the clock a little bit to when he was world class, one of the best defenders, then I think if we can have him and we know what Beraldo has been doing uh, lately, then I think if Marquinhos can step his game up, we should be in really good shape. So I'm going to go more on the defensive end of things. And I'm going to say PSG will advance past Barcelona if Donnarumma and Marquinhos can be at the top of their game. And I think if they are, we should be able to limit the amount of chances and goals that Barcelona score. And uh, then we're just going to need PSG to, to put a few past. And we should be, hopefully, through pretty smoothly and uh, face either Atletico or Dortmund. And uh, we already know that we can beat Dortmund, so we'll have lots of confidence going into that match if it's them. So um, that's what I'm going to go with. All right, so while all of us are thinking of the Champions League, PSG, you know, they are coming off that win over Nice in the Coupe de France where they advance to the semifinal. Another opportunity for some silverware there, so that's exciting. And then, of course, we've got this Sunday, PSG travels to Montpellier for League on Action. Uh, we're going to have more on that over on our site as well as on these airwaves, so just keep following and subscribing. Ethan, before we let you go, any final thoughts? Yeah, I got one final thought. Uh, I don't, if you guys check on Twitter right now, I wonder if he's deleted it by now. But uh, uh, Araujo for Barcelona, he and it's a very minor thing, but Barcelona and PSG fans care about it a lot. Uh, he posted, you know, about the the tie, you know, a little graphic with our logo and their logo, uh, you know, badge. Sorry, I know some people don't like the word logo. I'm talking about football clubs, but um, you know, with both clubs badges, and uh, he put, you know. Uh, red circle emoji, blue circle emoji, you know, because those are Barca's colors, right? Uh, anyone who really knows the dynamic of how football Twitter works knows that PSG is red blue, Barcelona is blue red. Uh, Barcelona are often ca called Blaugrana, I believe. That's their, you know, that's their one of their nicknames. Blaugrana means blue red, you know, so the order in which you say that matters. And so it looks like he's hyping up PSG based on the way that he put red first in that. So uh, a little funny. Uh, I know it's something that a lot of football fans might not recognize or understand, but to those who do understand it, it was a little funny. Uh, it looks like he's hyping up his opponent. So Hey, um, we'll take it. We'll take yeah, it. Hey, Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> maybe he wants us to win the tie. That's, that's kind of what I got from that tweet. I don't know about you guys. 
I'm going to yeah. have to find it and, and look into it. But that, that one is yeah. a little bit over my head, but Hey, if it, if it's uh they're hyping us up, I'll take it. Yeah. I, um, I, I retweeted it. Yeah. It's on my page. Um, there we go. Yeah. It's kind of funny. Yeah. I know it's now just a be... small difference, you know, red, blue instead of blue, red, but, uh, technically it does matter which order you put it in. This is true. This is true. Um, Ethan, great, uh, show recapping the, the champions league quarterfinal draw. A lot of really good teams. I, I feel like PSG did about as well as anyone could have hoped. So PSG supporters right now are optimistic about their chances. Let's keep that positivity going. Let's hopefully try to leave as much of the drama to the side. Of course, we'll talk about it if anything major happens. But let's have drama free until, what is it, April 10th uh, when PSG will host Barcelona at the park. So let's just hope for good health, no drama. Lots of wins, good form, goals. Let's just keep the positivity going until April 10th. And then we'll see how it goes against Barcelona. PSG should be favored and we'll hopefully be able to take care of business. So anyway, with that, thanks for listening uh, to PSG Talking. Make sure you subscribe and we'll catch you next time. Bye, everyone.